Well, Christ the Savior is born. And what a wonderful name, this name Jesus, the name above all names. I want to talk about that for a few minutes uh, this morning before we go right into the Lord's Supper. Incidentally, when you came in, hopefully you received one of the packets. It has some bread, it has a wafer, and also some juice. If you did not, now's a good time to maybe send someone in your party to, to head, head out and grab one of those because we'll go right into it at the end. Now, incidentally, when we observe the Lord's Supper, just a reminder, this is an expression, an outward symbol, a picture of what the Lord has done in our hearts. And so, uh, if you have boys and girls with you, it's a great chance for them to see it and watch it, and you can talk about it maybe later on. Uh, if you're here and you're just not feeling that, don't feel like anybody can look at you crossways. If you just, if you just uh, kind of check things out and, and, uh, and don't observe and, and to kind of take in what we're talking about. But I am so grateful to share this time with you. We've been looking all month long at the songs of the Gospel of Luke. I mentioned that the first two chapters of Luke are basically a musical, if you consider it. All through the Christmas account, we see these these verses or these songs. We see the song of Mary. We saw the song of Zacharias. We saw the song of the angels. And finally, we see the song of Simeon in Luke chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. Now, Simeon is an older saint who, along with Anna, is mentioned right after him. Uh, They've been waiting a long time for Messiah to come. And they've been in the temple courts, they have been looking for Messiah, and the Lord told Simeon that he would not pass until he had a chance to set his eyes on Messiah, which is pretty amazing. And so uh, we we see that uh, Luke goes all the way back to the beginning. The angels themselves confirmed that Jesus would be born. Joseph uh, uh, was the one who was affirmed as the adopted father. Uh, We we see uh, that it was announced to the shepherds. we see all these, these prophecies coming to fulfillment, and then Jesus is born, and then on the eighth day, something happens. And I'll begin in verse 25 of Luke 2. I want you to see this. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. His man, this man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and glory to your people Israel." It says his father and mother were amazed at what has been, was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed him and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed, and a sword will pierce your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. We celebrate today because of the wonder of one man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's different from anyone who was ever born, anyone who ever lived. He's unlike any other. We see him and know him as God himself, as God the Son. But in Simeon's song, for just a few minutes, I want you to see that we have an indication of why this man is so important, that he's above all else, that he is qualified to be the King of Kings. And Simeon tells us, first of all, I want you to see that Jesus is the source of salvation, Simeon sang this in verses 29 and 30. Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Jesus is the source of salvation. The fact that Simeon was the one who said this after studying the scriptures basically his whole life, these words are very important. He knows the significance of the word salvation. He's living among a a people who believe that salvation is going to come from working really hard from following the law, from checking all the boxes, from behaving well, more like Santa Claus than anything, like he sees you when you sleep and he knows when you're awake, so you better be good for goodness sake, right? I think I missed the line there, right? (laughs) Incidentally, did you know why uh, most people don't charge uh, for Santa Claus to park uh, on their roofs at Christmas? It's on the house, that's why. (laughs) Just thought I'd throw one out there. My, my oldest daughter's just shaking her head vigorously, no. She's like, no, Dad, okay. 
All right, Jesus is the source of salvation. You see, salvation comes from a man, not the law. Do you know that he says, my eyes have seen my salvation? That's very important because he recognizes that, that the salvation is not going to come from a behavior or a code. It's going to come from a person. He's looking at a person. He's saying, my eyes have seen salvation. Philippians 3, 7 said, but everything that was, that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. Do you see? There's nothing we can do based on our behavior that's going to solve our sin problem. In fact, the worst form of badness is really human goodness if it becomes a substitute for repentance because we think we're okay. It's like if I'm going the wrong way on a road, having a nicer road doesn't help. It hurts, right? Because I'm still going the wrong way. It's not about goodness in Jesus. It's not about ritual in Jesus. Listen, it's not about church membership in Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Now, one side note, I want you to note that the Holy Spirit comes on Simeon. Did you see that in the text? There's a theme throughout these verses we've seen in Luke 1 and 2 that I have to bring up. The Holy Spirit always has a role. Luke 1.35, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary. She conceived. Luke 1.45, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. She proclaimed a blessing on Mary and the Christ child. Luke 1.67, Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit. He sings the prophecy. And Luke 2.25, Simeon is filled with the Holy Spirit and he sings about Jesus. I want you to notice something. Every time the Holy Spirit shows up, he has the same role to point to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Jesus is the way, the source of salvation. Now, I want you to notice something else about Jesus that Simeon reminds us of today. Verse 31, you have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation. There's a word, revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. Jesus is not only the source of salvation, Jesus is the source of revelation. What is a revelation? It is something that is revealed. When Jesus came, he revealed God to us. Now, I don't, I don't know whether these games still uh, exist, but when I was a kid, one thing that fascinated me, maybe I was easily amused, was uh, board games that had these little red film things that you could put over the top of something. So something would be invisible and you use some like red see-through film and you put it over and all of a sudden it would appear. Uh, Clue Jr. had this outburst. Anyone play outburst? It had this little red film, and, and so, and then you had a password, if you ever played password. So these, these cards would have something virtually invisible, but then you'd put the red over, and then you kind of see in this light blue, you see the text. Anybody else play these games? All right, so the red film, would, would, there'd be something completely as a mystery, and then all of a sudden, if you had the right instrument, then you could look on it. And the reason you had these is because every family has people that cheat at games, and you have to cover it up. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're sitting next to the person who cheats at the games. I want to come down and raise my hand. She wants to do the same. Yeah, right? So you have to have these to avoid the cheaters in the family. You have to help them out. But I want you to see, we had really no way of even having a, a concept of God until Jesus came. And then all of a sudden, we had someone we could see. We had the source of revelation to understand how God related to us. And that's the reason Colossians 1, 15, and 16 puts it this way. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. You see, Christmas is about the incarnation. It describes God becoming flesh, making himself known to us. We sing about it every Christmas. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. That's what he did. This passage is an incredible picture of why Jesus came. God made flesh. Colossians 5, 16, everything was created by him. Do you see that? It means Jesus Christ was present with God the Father at creation. Jesus didn't begin to exist at Christmas time. Do you understand? He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And yet he took on human flesh for you so that we could have a revelation, a revealing of who God is. It's a wonderful thing. When we understand that Jesus is like no one else. Now, I want to show you one more thing here. Jesus is not only the source of salvation. Jesus is the source of revelation. But it, we also see in Simeon's song that Jesus is the source of tension. I say, well, that's an interesting point at Christmas. Merry Christmas, right? Jesus is the source of tension. Look back at verses 33 through 35. 
His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel to be a sign that will be opposed. And watch this. And a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Wow. Mary's soul would be pierced. Why would Mary's soul be pierced? We know that that took place because her son would literally be pierced for the sins of man. Listen, we talked about this a few weeks ago. When we think about the Christmas spirit, we tend to think about peaceful things, don't we? No more lives torn apart. Well, well, that may be your grown-up Christmas list, but it's not the spirit of Christmas. Simeon's prophecy is saying that Jesus came because lives were being torn apart and we desperately needed help. We couldn't heal ourselves no matter how how grown up our Christmas list is. You see, Simeon is saying we are irreconcilable without sacrifice. We're hopeless without sacrifice. Now, last night, uh, It's a Wonderful Life came on NBC. It does, I think, every year. NBC must own the rights. And so... So I'm watching it again, you know, while I'm doing other stuff, because I kind of know how it goes at this point. How many of you have seen It's a Wonderful Life? There you go. All right, most of you. The rest of you, are you living without television completely? (laughs) How is this possible? Several hands didn't go up. All right, that's okay. So you're, you're good for you. You're without technology. That's good. Probably the most famous Christmas movie. And it is amazing. But can I tell you one thing that really bothers me about this movie? You remember George Bailey, Jimmy Stewart loses everything because of the double cross of Mr. Potter. Uh, George has a vision that he was never born. You know how it goes. And then at the end, all the people of the town come through. They cover the debts of George and they celebrate friendship and family at Christmas. But one thing that's always bothered me is they sing Merry Christmas. And and I think they're singing Auld Lang Syne and then the credits roll. And I'm like, are you kidding me right now? That's not the way it should end. Because nobody took care of Mr. Potter. Like, Mr. Potter wasn't just a miser. He was a criminal. He stole the man's money. So what should happen is they sing to George. They celebrate friendship. Uh, George's war hero brother shows up, and they, they sing. And then they all say, now let's load up, and let's go beat up Potter. Let's go. Wouldn't that be a great ending? Let's go down to the bank, and let's haul him off to jail, and then roll the credits. Like, that's a good Christmas movie right there. We're going we're gonna to celebrate Christmas, but first we're going to get a pound of potter right now. That's the way it ought to go. Potter gets off scot-free. You know why that bothers me? Same reason it bothers you. There's something in us that has a sense of justice. Because we are wired in the image of God, we want to see when there is a wrong, that there is a payment for that wrong, that something needs to happen. And we long for that to take place, right? Why? Because there is a tension that we feel. We desperately uh, need to take care of sin. We can't just wave it off or shrug it off. But we also desperately need a Savior because we know of our own sin. I know of my own sin. And I need a Savior. This is the tension. Do you see? We could not reconcile our own problem. And this is why Jesus can never be just an interesting concept. I mean, it's, it's intellectually dishonest to talk to somebody and say, well, I just think, I think God is interesting, you know, and, and Jesus seemed like a good person a great teacher, and I'm sort of into Jesus, but I don't, I don't know that I buy into repentance, that sort of thing. No, it doesn't work that way. I mean, it, it can't. There is, there is a natural tension when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ because he's like no other. We either recognize that we're sinners in need of a Savior, and we cry out to him and experience that, or we just have to kind of say, he, he's not for me, and, and I, don't, I don't need a Savior, you see? But the beauty is, Jesus gave us a much better choice because he came, because he paid the penalty for sin, then the gift of grace is available to all of us. You take a good look at the manger this Christmas and you'll see the glorious message that even though we've blown any opportunity we had to be good enough, God has entered into our hopelessness hopelessness, to give us a way to hope. Do you see? Now, I would be remiss. I know that a number of our church family are watching in Kingston online. If I did not say to all of you here and all watching online, listen, what better day than Christmas morning, 2022, to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, recognizing, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. 
I don't have it all figured out, but I do believe that Jesus died for my sin. And I believe that he rose again to demonstrate that it was enough as a payment for my sin. And I invite you, Lord, to come into my life, to forgive my sin, to save my soul. And I want to live the less rest of my life for you as you give me the grace to do it. That's available to everybody within the sound of my voice right now. You know, I think that's why this is the perfect day to experience the Lord's Supper together. So we're going to do that in just a moment. Would you bow with me? It's a great opportunity, my friends, if there's someone here who just wants to trust Christ right now. That decision that changes everything. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift you've given us at the incarnation that when Christ was born, he wasn't just another man. He was like no other. Jesus Christ, the source of salvation. Jesus Christ, the source of revelation. Jesus Christ, the source of glorious tension that calls us to repentance. So God, as we partake of these elements, we remember, we identify with what the Lord Jesus has done giving his body, shedding his blood on our behalf. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.